Hello and hi there. This is James Lindsay. You are listening to the New Discourses podcast. We are eyeballs deep in our initial foray of initial investigation into critical education theory, more formally known as critical pedagogy. Had to take a slight um a slight detour through how Marxism is actually a theology in order to get to this point. If you recall the last we left off in this series, which was the third and out of infinity, probably, in the critical pedagogy series that I'm doing here on the podcast, uh, we were reading, if you recall the structure, we were reading through Isaac Gottsman's Critical Turn in Education, which I encourage every one of you to pick up and read because it's apparently going to take us 300 years to get through it. Just read it for yourself. And what I said that we were going to do is go piece by piece through Gottsman I'm not going to read the whole book, but I'm going to go through the different sources that he encounters or that he brings up. And I'm going to explain to you, we're we're not just going to read about the critical turn in pedagogy. And I'm not just going to tell you that we're going to do exactly what Gottsman tells us to do in his book, which is to read the primary sources alongside his secondary source. And so we then took a detour from chapter one in Gottsman's book into uh, this other book by Paulo Freire, who is the godfather, the intellectual godfather of critical pedagogy. He's not the father of critical pedagogy or critical education theory. That's Henry Giroux, a Canadian-American Marxist educator who had tremendous influence, who also is the person who brought Paulo Freire's influence into the United States in particular, uh, at least on the U.S. side of things. And in the first paragraph, which is how far we've got through Gottsman's book, in the first paragraph, we run into a discussion, in fact, a book review of Paulo Freire's 1985 book titled The Politics of Education. And so the goal, of course, of that chapter is to frame out Freire as the intellectual godfather, but not the intellectual father of critical pedagogy. And um, what we end up with is that we we see that the, the bulk of the chapter is dedicated to Freire's most famous and most impactful work, the third most cited work in uh, social sciences and humanities, which is titled The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And we're going to spend some time on that eventually because it's obviously this kind of like deep text now for our entire education system since the 1980s when Freire's in, uh, influence got brought into education, which was already radicalizing, was already going into the critical turn in education, which Gottsman obviously documents as having started through the 1970s with characters like Michael Apple, who wrote the uh, series forward or whatever to Gottsman's book, um, and then characters like Giroux himself. There are others We'll, we'll talk about Stanley Aronowitz is one, uh, Herbert Bowles and somebody, Michael or something, Gintis, Michael Apple, uh, maybe I already mentioned Michael Apple, sorry, uh, lots of other characters. Eventually, we're going to talk about Joe Kinchelow. Um, I think that's how you pronounce his last name. And, and so lots of other characters. Ira Shore is another S-H-O-R. Uh So there are lots of these characters in the critical turn of education that we're going to address as we go along, and we introduce that. And then we get detoured into this book that from 1985 versus Pedagogy of the Press, by the way, was 1970. uh, And it was very much ignored in North America. It was very influential in South America where it ruined a continent, but it was more or less ignored in North America until after the politics of education which is, like I said, 1985, which blasted Freire at the hands of Henry Drew into the education, the education of education, so education college limelight, uh, teacher college limelight at the time. And so I started reading this book, which I had not read before this series began. I had skipped this one and I was just kind of like, holy moly. Um, so I read the first half of the introduction to this book in the third episode of the Critical Pedagogy uh, podcast series. And then I said, oh my God, to continue with this, I have to read to read the second half of this introduction, which is by Henry Drew. I have to go into how Marxism is a theology. It's not possible to understand the figure of Freire and his influence without understanding this all as a religion and Freire as a prophet and a renewer of the faith that had faltered and failed. 
the biggest picture, you have Marx comes out, espouse, or puts out a theology, um, Lenin takes it in his own direction, etc. But the critical theorists are looking on this stuff in the 1920s and then 1930s and saying something's not right. Marx is, something's wrong with Marx's theory. And they come up with what eventually, first is called cultural Marxism and eventually becomes critical Marxism or critical theory uh, to try to explain this. And this, as by the 1960s, we have Herbert Marcuse writing in a totally new theological vein, deeply rooted in Freud and the great refusal and so on. And this is so negative by this point. It's so negative thinking, so hopeless, so despairing that it itself is running itself into the ground, even though it's finding all this energy for its activism in identity politics, which I say gave birth to what we call identity Marxism, including the race Marxism of uh, critical race theory uh, as its kind of most visible form for most people right now, though there's critical gender theory, there's queer theory, which is a critical theory of sex, gender, and sexuality overall. There's a critical approach to the study of whiteness, a critical ap approach to the study of disability, of fatness, of nutrition, of literally anything you can think of now. And so I don't feel like I could communicate what Freire represents. I said in the previous podcast that he's kind of this guru character, and that's an impression I get from reading him, but more it's an impression I get from reading people like Giroux and these other critical education theorists when they talk about their relationship and the influence that Freire had on them. And so and in the third episode of the series, what I point out is that what, what Freire brought back in, I titled it and a new hope or a new hope, something, something, a new hope, you know, obviously an allusion to star Wars, but that's what Freire brought in this concept of critical hope that, which is basically the hope that Marxism can work if we do it right this time. And he, it's a renewal of hope and faith. So Freire occupies a position. I said guru, but he's more accurately, he occupies a position of a prophet and, um, not to, diminish the role of Jesus in Christianity. But if we take just for the moment, the idea of Jesus as prophet, in addition to being son of God, etc., uh, the relationship I think would be best articulated by saying that you have Jesus as, and it is just, just an analogy. Don't get wrapped up in it. I'm not making a theological claim here you know, that Jesus as prophet. And then Paul being kind of his first great evangelist, Jeru is like Freire's first great evangelist and then brought him to the American market. And a lot of Drew's works could be seen similar to the Pauline epistles of this critical Marxist religion. So you could imagine like in parallel that the Jewish religion has hit this point well under Roman occupation, et cetera, that it's now in the position of tremendous feeling of oppression, et cetera. They're seeking a Messiah, whatever your beliefs about Jesus. If you're a Christian, you believe he is the Messiah. If not, you think he's a prophet, like whatever, um, you have this figure come in. So critical theory is now hitting this wall of despair and it needs kind of a Messiah figure. And Freire actually ends up kind of filling that role as some kind of great prophet of this hope based, critical hope based Marxism. Uh, and that's his relevance. And so his first great evangelist becomes Henry Drew. And I just say this you know, it's all just a metaphor. Don't take it too literally. The point of this is just to kind of understand the relationship of within this broad Marxist religion that you kind of have this thing running down into a point where it feels like they've lost everything. The 20th century was not kind to Marxists uh, in the end, and, and it wasn't going so great. And you have some hope for them looking at Mao, but oh my God, that was really bad. And they copied a lot of Mao's techniques. And we see that, and this, since this is an education thing, we see SEL, for example, social emotional learning, reproducing in a psychological context, a lot of the Maoist program and the Groomer Schools 3 podcast I did covers that, if you want to refer back to that, how that works. Um, if we use the metaphor of the pandemic, that we have going on so SEL, it becomes a psychological, a psychology based syringe to inject the Marx, the, the woke Marxist poison, which has different elements that work together, like critical uh, race theory on the one hand and uh, queer theory on the other to create favorable and unfavorable identity categories and pathways to move between them. You can become an ally, you can become bisexual, you can become trans, you can whatever to get out of your straight 
white, probably not male, it works better on females, but your straight white identity that, or your, your conservative identity or whatever it happens to be. And so you create this dynamic to move people, especially children, into a revolutionary posture. And the critical hope lies within that. And so we, we start to understand then the religious nature of both Marxism and woke Marxism, but also of Freire and the Freirean aspect of the theory. I would go so far as to say that as much as I've said that wokeness is this kind of hybrid infusion of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. What I would tell you is it's like, think of it like an elixir, like or an emulsifier, really, I guess is what we need to have that you have oil and water and postmodernism and critical theory, though they're both critical in orientation and mar broadly Marxian in orientation are in a sense, very much like oil and water. They don't mix. They need an emulsifier. If you want to make like salad dressing out of them and the way that you, that, that, that emulsifier becomes Freirean critical pedagogy. Uh, and the magic is that what Freire does is he turns Marxism back inward and it makes it a project of individual spiritual renewal through critique, which is, in my opinion, what Marx really hoped for with his theology and why I took that diversion into the Marxian theology. The idea with Marxism as a theology in the kind of a nutshell is that you have a vision of the perfect social world and you project that out into the world by doing the work, which is socialism uh, or Marxist socialism. And then you become social man who understands himself in relation to the social nature. So eventually over the long haul, what happens is every man becomes a socialist and the society becomes socialist together and everything works in harmony because everybody ends up on the same page, uh, all for one and one for all or whatever. And so uh, what you have then is this religion grinding down, hitting a point of tragic despair, splitting into these two kind of immiscible um, pieces, postmodernism and, and neo-Marxism. And then the Freirean model actually is what allows them. Giroux is the one who brought the European theorists back to Freire. Uh, but the Freirean uh, Freire works in a sense like the emulsifier that allows their blending. And so wokeness is what I, the, all that long, complicated metaphor or analogy is for is that wokeness works. Wokeness is the seat more than neo Marx, or sorry, critical pedagogy. The Freirean critical model, critical education model is more of the substrate of wokeness as a faith than neo-Marxism and postmodernism, but neo-Marxism and postmodernism are the ingredients that it's actually kind of made of. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated, but it wouldn't work without this. So the neo-Marxist religion spawned off the new left and the new left was very unpopular and burned itself out. It did spontaneous or it did, it did generate some uh, very radical identity politics that went on to form critical, uh, sorry, intersectionality and the critical theories of identity, the identity Marxism, but what actually made these things move into society and that made them what they are, which is so obscenely narcissistic, et cetera, which kind of, if you look at like Marcuse, he realized it had to be there, but he didn't know how to get to it is this Freirean concept where the work is actually mostly happening within you the personal is political. Everything is a political is a teaching moment, and that teaching moment is located in every possible uh, thing. Everything is a pedagogy. We talked about that in the last episode of the podcast. There's a pedagogy of the city, the pedagogy of the oppressed. I forgot what they all are. It's like ten books. The pedagogy of everything. Everything in the universe becomes a teaching moment to generate what Freire referred to as critical moments, where the critical consciousness or conscientization can occur, and that means becoming more of what Marx referred to as social or socialist man. In other words, that you're having your awakening into uh, the socialist mindset. And it became more of a personal relationship with critique to, again, mirror Christianity under Freire. And that was the magic sauce that allowed this to go. And so Giroux, as his um, apostle, or not as his apostle, as his evangelist, his first key evangelist, is uh, who, who wrote the introduction to this book. And I think it really shines through. And we, I'm not going to read through all of this book. In fact, I'm going to ignore a lot of it. But chapters six, seven, and eight, and maybe nine, I don't know, maybe past that, get really into how just clearly religious this is. I've, I realized I could not communicate what's in this book without letting people understand first that you have a theology operating in Marxism and that Freire understood that, that, uh, theology in a way that most other Marxists 
up to that point had not and brought this new thing. And then Jeru sees what that is. He has this whole story about how he's like failing at what he's trying to do with his radical teaching, ends up reading the pedagogy of the oppressed, has this or road to Damascus transformation moment. And then he becomes the evangelist for this guy. And with this book, he gets his influence finally brought significantly to the United States. And I think that this is the right way to understand the relationship between Giroux and critical pedagogy and Freire and Giroux, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a bunch of framing. What I wanted to do in this episode now is to actually break into the second half of Giroux's introduction. That's all we're going to read for this one. Hopefully it won't take too long. Uh, the second half of Henry Giroux's introduction to the politics of education by Paulo Freire. And then we will do an episode or two or more. We'll see what happens on this book. And then we'll get back to Gottsman into the pedagogy of the oppressed to let you know where we're going someday. I think I actually have to, just as a matter of a little bit more housekeeping, I have to start talking about the modern end of this, not just the historical end. I don't know what I want to do. So I'm going to start sprinkling back and forth. I'm going to have to read, for example, the introductory paper by a woman with the last name of Gay uh, about uh, culturally responsive teaching, for example. Um, I'm going to have to start digging into the idea of SEL versus social emotional learning versus transformative social emotional learning and eventually liberatory education, which is kind of the trajectory that they're using to keep pushing this Marxism into our education system. In the meantime, I, I heard an analogy at this conference I went to recently that you have to see what's going on in our education system or public education, but also private education, our education system across the board as effectively being that the building is on fire, the schoolhouse is on fire, and you need to start thinking very seriously about ways that you're going to act if that were really, it's an ideological fire, but you have to think in terms of that, and your children are in that building. And so obviously you need to start thinking very seriously about figuring out how you're going to protect your children from that fire. I don't know if you're going to try to give them fireproof clothing clothing, and send them to school, in other words, to teach them how to recognize this and, and ignore it or fight back against it or deprogram them when they come home every day or whatever it's going to be. I don't know if it means pulling your kids out of the school. Uh, I don't know if it means lots of different things you might do. But protecting your children from this influence is going to have to be a top priority for you. And it's going to take me a while to unfold and unwrap all of this. And hopefully it'll become a, a useful resource for people who are trying to either fix or clean up or whatever, reform or whatever it is, purge the Marxists out of our schools. And this is going to be a very difficult process. And I will tell you, it is the most important part of the fight except with the stuff about digital ID and vaccine passports and all of that that's going on in the world right now. Um, and even if we stop the digital ID, vaccine passport, social credit system monstrosity, this is still the collapse of our society in the schools using your children as props to do it. So it's very important that we, we take this fight here. So let me pick up then with uh, Giroux here, Henry Giroux. In the introduction to the politics of education, uh, second half of his introduction to this. Uh, and so it starts off with a section titled Liberation Theology and the Language of Possibility. So that's what they, that's what Giroux sees Freire bringing to the table. Liberation Theology. Liberation Theology, just a quick sidebar. What is Liberation Theology? Liberation Theology is Marxist Catholicism. That's what it is, which took over the left wing of Catholicism throughout South America. Uh, primarily. And there are weird tenuous connections, or not tenuous, significant connections that have to kind of be mentioned. I'm not expert enough to talk about these yet. But you have, for example, within the liberation theology hierarchy or umbrella, this relatively unknown guy. It, to be clear, by the way, who brought Freire to the U.S. in the first place and get his book to the U.S. in the first place? They ended up getting it in Henry Drew's lap through one means or another eventually. It was liberation theologist priests who had liberation theology priest uh, contacts in kind of the Boston, New York area. And they brought him in through that, both physically to the United States and his materials. And one of these priests that worked with Freire in South America, and the connections are are tight, is a, is a fellow by the name of Helder Kamara, which is Dom Helder Kamara because he's a priest. Uh, so Dom Helder Kamara is worth mentioning not because I know particularly all that much about his liberation theology, except that he was a liberation theolo uh, theologian. What I do know, though, is that he also was considered 
a spiritual mentor to Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab was very well aware of Dom Helder Kamara. And so the liber- he was also, by the way, a significant uh, influence upon the current Pope, Pope Francis, who, of course, is a South American, uh, Argentine, and uh, is a liberation the- theologian. In other words, the current Pope is a Marxist who is approaching his Catholic as Catholic faith, as as Catholicism, through a a heavy influence of Laurentian theology. But we have this weird connection in Dom Helder Camara tying Paulo Freire, um, you know, under Dom Helder Camara, we have Paulo Freire, the current Pope, Pope Francis, and Klaus Schwab, who considered him to be a spiritual father to him, um, despite the fact that Klaus Schwab is certainly not a Catholic. And you see that connection between uh, Francis and Schwab playing out to this day. So just to mention that he's this same Kamara is significant in bringing Freire's work to at least to getting it where it is. And then I don't know if he was directly involved or not, but other liberation theologian type or theology type priests were significantly or directly involved in getting Freire's work to North America, even as it rampaged through and destroyed education in South America, particularly Brazil, but throughout most of the rest of South America as well. Okay, so a little sidebar, liberation theology in the language of possibility. And that's the hope. That's the hope where this, we have the spiritual renewal in the prophet figure of, of uh, Paulo Freire, and that's what his evangelist here, Henry Drew, sees. And so reading this, and you're going to hear just how crazy religious this is immediately. And this is like the paragraph, this first couple of paragraphs are the ones that really tipped me off. Like, okay, we've really got to dig into this. And again, let me just recontextualize this so we get out of the abstract. This is the dominant ideology ruling schooling throughout North America in particular and the West right now. And if you don't understand this as a state religion, you are missing everything. And if you don't understand what that means, you're also missing everything. And what that means is it has no damn business, at least in the United States, where a state religion, especially in public schools, is strictly prohibited by the First Amendment to the Constitution. The state is not to endorse a religion, and it is certainly not to uh, program people or indoctrinate people or even train people up in a religion in our public schools. That's First Amendment is not ambiguous on this point. Now listen how religious this is, picking up with Henry Giroux now. Central to Freire's politics and pedagogy, he tells us, is a philosophical vision of a liberated humanity. We've covered infinite times on the podcast now that liberated humanity is a Marxian, Marxian term. It is Marxism. Liberated from what? Liberated from all oppression and even the oppression foisted on people by reality itself. The limitations that prevent us from being liberated are limitations on our own subjectivity that are created by the social relations that are created by the dom- the systems of domination operant in society that are reinforced by ideology, etc. That's Marxist theory or theology. And so we have to expand the pon- potentialities of being, according to Michel Foucault, the postmodern, postmarxist, uh, and so liberation means liberation from all forms of oppression, all forms of injustice, all forms of, uh, of 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 subordination. I guess is another word. We have to get away from all of that, and we're going to achieve that through Marxist theory becoming uh, actualized. So central, Drew tells us to Freire's politics and pedagogy. That means how schools are run, our schools now, because of the influence of this book and this man, Giroux, and the other man, Freire. Central to Freire's politics and pedagogy is a philosophical vision of a liberated humanity. The nature of this vision is rooted in a respect for life and the acknowledgement that the hope and vision of the future that inspire it are not meant to provide consolation for the oppressed as much as to promote ongoing forms of critique and a struggle against objective forces of oppression. Now, and I linger on a part of this, not meant to provide consolation for the oppressed. That's Marx's favorite or famous injunction from his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right in 1844, that religion is the opiate of the masses. He argues there 
very clearly that the point of religion, Marx does, that the point of religion is actually to give people a consolation for their oppression so that they will accept it. It's the opium of the masses that get them, keep them from rejecting and revolting against their, uh, their oppression. And it's, it's actually, his argument is really intense. I read it in the previous episode of the podcast here. Um, see if I can find where it says that, but, uh, religious suffering, this is Marx from what I just said, from the contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right from 1844, religious suffering is at one and the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call upon them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. An oppressive world that you have to escape from by believing that God ordained it this way for mysterious reasons. For example... The criticism of religion is therefore in embryo the criticism of that veil of tears of which religion is the halo. And he goes on a little further down to say the criticism of religion disillusions man so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality like a man who has discarded his illusions and regained his senses so that he will move around opium dulls your senses so that he will move around himself as his own true son. S-U-N. Religion is the only illusory sun which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. And so there's your liberation, gang. That's the uh, liberation that we're talking about at the heart of Freire's politics and pedagogy. That's the philosophical vision. And we have it given to us there again. The nature of this vision is rooted in a respect for life, <laughs> means Marxism, and the acknowledgement that the hope and vision of the future that inspire it, that's communism, are not meant to provide consolation for the oppressed as much as to promote ongoing forms of critique and a struggle against a for objective forces of oppression. That's his moving, acting, and thinking for his own happiness, turning himself into his own sun that revolves around itself, if that makes any sense. By combining we're back to Giroux, by combining the dynamics of critique and collective struggle with a philosophy of hope, for, this is so important to get, this is how religious this is. This is what's at the heart of our schools. Listen to this whole sentence. So there's your philosophy of hope mixed with Marxism. So he's mixed in critical hope with Marxism, dynamics of critique and collective struggle, Marxism, with a philosophy of hope, which we discussed in the previous episode as critical hope, which is a hope that critical theory will work if it's made sufficiently into a project of internal spiritual renewal. Now listen to what he says about this. By combining the dynamics of critique and collective struggle with a philosophy of hope, Freire has created a language of possibility that is rooted in what he calls a permanent prophetic vision. Underlying this prophetic vision is a faith that as Dorothy Soel, S-O-E-L-L-E, -E, maybe I've mispronounced it, argues in Choosing Life, quote, makes life present to us and so makes it possible. It is a great yes to life, one that presupposes our power to struggle. That's the end of that quote from Dorothy uh, Soel, or I hope I said that right. This is a faith. This is a faith in the school that combines the idea of critical hope into Marxist theory. And it is considered a permanent prophetic vision of a liberated humanity, in other words, of communism. That's what Freire brings. That's what his evangelist writing this epistle at the beginning of this book sees in the Gospel of Freire. Freire's attack, he tells us, against all forms of oppression, his call to link ideology critique, ideology critique, <laughs> Marxism, 
with collective action and the prophetic vision central to his politics are heavily indebted to the spirit and ideological dynamics that have both informed and characterized the, the, the theologies of liberation that have emerged primarily from Latin America since the early 1970s. Again, that's Marxism that went into Catholicism in Latin America primarily. And he says right here, the prophetic vision central to his politics are heavily indebted to the spirit and ideological dynamics that have informed and characterized liberation theology. Liberation theology has been retooled to look like pedagogy by Paulo Freire and has been brought into our schools as such by Henry Giroux. This is a religion in our schools. The, the theology of that religion is Marxism of one form or another, woke Marxism in the present day. Its tools are things like culturally responsive education, ethnic studies, critical race theory, social emotional learning, and so on to make it happen in various capacities depending on what they are. But this is liberation theology has been retooled as critical pedagogy by Paulo Freire and evangelized for by uh, Henry Giroux. The oversight by the Supreme Court to have never named Marxism as a theology or as a religion as it should have done in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s is unbelievable in terms of the consequences that it's had now in, 2020, in the 2020s. What kind of a faith is it? It is, of course, a dialectical faith, the dialectical faith of leftism. So what does Giroux tell us? In truly dialectical fashion, by the way, by me pointing out that this is a this is liberation theology retooled to dominate our schools in a superficially secular form where do the work is actually its religious commandment and all you hear them talk about, all of this is actually illegal by First Amendment law in the United States already. This, this isn't just a 14th Amendment violation because there's racism baked into it and sexism and all these other things. This is a First Amendment violation of the most egregious sort. When the Biden administration or any state government endorses or supports any of this, they are violating the First Amendment to the federal constitution of the United States. They are acting grotesquely illegally in the form of having created and implementing a state religion into our children with the goal that if enough generations of children are raised this way, they won't know any different. Not just indoctrination, but reprogramming of our children in the process to think how like liberation theologians, in other words, Marxist Catholics, and they've just made up a secular version of it and called it critical pedagogy. So in truly dialectical fashion, because it's a truly dialectical faith, and the Freire has truly understood Marx and probably even Hegel before him. In truly dialectical fashion, Freire has criticized and rescued the radical underside of revolutionary Christianity. Why is revolutionary Christianity, pretending not to be revolutionary Christianity, considered non-religious and allowed to be in our schools? That's a question. You can't have conservative Christianity in schools. I agree with that. You can't have any Christianity in schools, but why, if you just slightly repackage it, why is it okay for radical underside, the radical underside of revolutionary Christianity to be repackaged and put into our schools? Why is that okay? Because it's posing, it, it's doing what it's doing through Marxism, which the Supreme Court has neglected to identify as a religion as it should have done all along. As the reader We'll discover in this book, Giroux tells us, Freire is a harsh critic of the reactionary church, which means all forms of Christianity that are not the radical underside of revolutionary Christianity. At the same time, he situates his faith and sense of hope in the God of history, Marxist God, or Hegelian God, and of the oppressed, whose teachings make it impossible, in Freire's words, to, quote, reconcile Christian love with the exploitation of human beings, end quote. Within the, dis that's, a, that's a straight liberation theology claim, by the way. It's a straight liberation theology retooling of Christianity to say that it actually means Marxism. It's a complete distortion. It's a heresy. It's also still a religion and has no place in our schools. Within the discourse of theologies of liberation, Giroux tells us, Freire fashions a powerful theoretical antidote to the cynicism and despair of many left radical critics. So that's what I'm saying. He brings this, what's his figure? What, is, what did he do as a great prophet of Marxism, Paulo Freire? He brought hope back to the people 
the Marxists, or I guess, who have lost hope by seeing the catastrophes of the 20th century and the despair and central negativity of neo-Marxism or critical Marxism, which has no positivity left. That this is the point where in 19, late 1960s, you have Adorno writing negative dialectics. We're not even going to try synthesis anymore. You have Adorno saying that it's not possible to cast a positive image of the utopia. It's not possible to give a positive image. All we can do is critique the existing society. You have Horkheimer saying it's not possible to express the uh, liberated world or the, the the better. It's not possible to per, per, to to, uh, ex, to to explain the the good, even the ideal society, the better society in the existing language. But we of the uh, the existing language and the existing society and the terms of the existing society. Therefore, we ha- all we can do is critique the existing constant negativity, constantly critique the existing society. You have Marcuse telling us that neg- negative thinking is the basis of everything, and that negative thinking becomes positive. And the way that it does that is by critiquing away the oppressive shell so that the ideal society contained within it can flourish and blossom, which is straight up alchemy. We're going to tear everything down because the seed of gold is inside of it. If we can just get the mundane aspects of the base metal of society to be torn away through relentless critique, then the gold seed will blossom on its own. Straight magic theology. And what Freire as prophet brings to this cynicism and despair is a, as Drew says, a powerful theoretical antidote, which is critical hope rooted in liberation theology. The utopian character, Giroux tells us, the utopian character of his analysis is concrete in its nature and appeal. It gives you something real to do, which is to work on yourself as a spiritual renewal through the work, because everything becomes a teaching moment, and takes as its starting point collective actors in their various historical settings and the particularity of their problems and forms of oppression. It is utopian only in the sense. Now, they always know that bringing up utopia is not a good idea. If you don't know where the I, the word utopia came from, utopia is a Greek word that means nowhere or derives from the Greek that would mean nowhere. And so it doesn't exist anywhere. So why on earth is the perfect place called utopia? Why is it named nowhere? Well, the, the word utopia in the sense that we use it was created by Thomas More, a theologian and philosopher in the uh, 16th century, 15th and 16th century, who was actually uh, put to death by Henry VIII. And Thomas More wrote a satirical book called Utopia, explaining this idea of creating a perfect world, which would basically be, you know, him projecting out what something like liberation theology or collectivist theology is envisioning and saying, essentially, this place doesn't exist. You cannot build the kingdom of God on earth. The kingdom of God is in heaven. And if it's going to come to earth, it'll come through God. This is the, the this is a Christian theological view. And I think it's one of the most important Christian theological views is that we're not going to get heaven on earth. Don't try to make it. That is the kind of hubris that destroys societies. Tower of Babel would be another similar story being told in the Bible of these kinds of things. And so they know that utopia is like this bad word. But they know also that they are actually utopian. He just said, he just said that this is a utopian vision. The utopian character of his analysis is concrete in his nature and appeal and takes as its starting point collective actors in their various his collective actors and their various historical settings and the particularity of their problems and forms of oppression because the personal is political is kind of the deep seed of this critical hope. And then, but he's like, wait, 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 wait. I said utopian. We got to be careful because somebody's going to say, no, 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 that means nowhere. That's a, we got made fun of for that already. People are kind of in our line of thought that doesn't exist. That's a utopia is a bad word. And they know this. So then he says it is utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender to the risks and dangers that face all challenges to dominant power structures. In other words, it's utopian in that it's hopeful that it can subvert all power structures. It is utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender. So it's, for for Giroux and in some of his other works, and we'll probably talk about this eventually in the series, utopian means that you uh, can still imagine, you can still envision a far improved society or an improved society or a communist society. You can envision the idea that this is not out of the realm of realistic possibility, that you can actually create heaven. It doesn't mean that you know what it looks like. 
And that's kind of one of the insights that he took from, say, Marcuse and Horkheimer, uh, probably Adorno as well. You can't cast a positive image of it, but you can believe that it's possible. Like you want to feel like those those old McDonald's commercials, like if you believe in magic and then how does it end? Like you always have a friend wearing big red shoes. In other words, you'll always be a freaking clown. Uh, But anyway, um, clown world, it's utopian only in the sense that it refuses to surrender to the risks and dangers that face all challenges to dominant power structures. It is prophetic in that it views the kingdom as kingdom of God as something to be created on earth, but only through a faith in both other human beings and the necessity of permanent struggle. So when I said build the kingdom of God, by the way, I wasn't going far from the text. It is prophetic in that it views the kingdom of God, prophetic in that it views the kingdom of God as something to be created on earth, but only through a faith in both other human beings. In other words, communism, the ability for other human beings to be socialized into becoming socialist man who is going to want to live in the kingdom of God on earth, which is socialism according to their religion. And how do we get there? Through faith in the necessity of permanent struggle. And that's actually in this book, Freire arguing that the the revolution must be continuous and permanent. There's never a point of settling down. The point isn't actually to create utopia. It's to have constant, constant revolution. It can never stop. And this is one of the things that he brings to the table that it's inflamed people like Giroux and that have inspired the woke. The point people always ask, what, what is the goal of critical race theory? Well, the simple goal is that it's to empower critical race theorists to put into action what they're doing. Well, what are they doing? They want permanent revolution. They want nothing to become settled because the moment it becomes settled, it becomes a status quo. The moment it becomes the status quo, it generates social relations that are going to be enforced by ideology, etc. In other words, what Freire sees here, and that became the, the, the source of the, the, the vision of wokeness, the goal of wokeness as a religion, woke Marxism, is that there is no end point. There's only constantly, continuously, forever doing the work. And magically, at some point, deliverance might be at the end of the communist rainbow. The necessity of permanent struggle. That's what you have faith in. That's where the hope lies. That's what critical hope is about. And it is prophetic that it's viewing the kingdom of God as something to be created on earth through social socializing man into socialist man. And the necessity, in other words, raising consciousness constantly, turning everybody into a critical theorist and the necessity of permanent struggle executed through their practice, which is theory inspired action. In other words, the work, which you must constantly do. Let me remind you just for context, this is what they've installed as the backbone of our schools in all 14,000 plus school districts in the United States. This is undeniably a religion. It doesn't even try to hide it. You're building the kingdom of God on earth through these tools using liberation theology, which is a religious view, which is the radical underbelly of revolutionary Christianity doesn't even try to hide that it's a religion. That is what's happening in our schools. And this is strictly illegal already. First Amendment challenges that can make this argument need to be happening all over this country until the SCOTUS is forced to take this up and look it in the face and declare this crap as a religion. The notion of faith that emerges in Freire's work, Drew tells us, is informed by the memory of the oppressed the suffering that must not be allowed to continue, and the need to never forget that the prophetic vision is an ongoing process, a vital aspect of the very nature of human life. Now let's flash over to Robin D'Angelo who tells us that anti-racism is a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of what? Of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. In other words, doing the work primarily on yourself as a process of spiritual renewal. And Robin D'Angelo comes into this from the educational aspect of this, which would be highly informed by the Freirian uh, the, the theology. We, are to never, we need to never forget that the prophetic vision is an ongoing process, a vital aspect of the very nature of human life. 
In short, by combining the discourses of critique and possibility, Freire joins history and theology in order to provide the theoretical basis for a radical pedagogy that combines hope, critical reflection, and collective struggle. It is at this juncture that the work of Paulo Freire becomes crucial to the, to the development of a radical pedagogy. For in Freire, we find the dialectician of contradictions and emancipation. In Freire's work, a discourse is developing uh, that is develop. Oh, sorry. In Freire's work, a discourse is developing that bridges the relationship between agency and structure. Okay, so where we talked to him in the past, I'll come back to this. Where we've talked. First of all, let me just pause. We have, we're developing a radical pedagogy. Um, he's. It's all dialectical faith. It's all about the contradictions and emancipation. Okay, that's all Marx and Mar Marxist, 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 uh, and that's meant to be like Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Um, in Freire's work, we see a discourse is developing that bridges the relationship between agency and structure. So this is where we're talking about, and we've talked so many times now about material determination and structural determination uh, as, as core pillars within, say, critical race theory or within all of the woke Marxist theory. Uh, what, where is agency located? Where are human beings agents? And for the Marxists, as I've been saying, as for these woke Marxists, agency exists in being a woke Marxist. That's it. Everything else that you're doing is succumbing to some form of false consciousness. Uh, so structure and agency become the core of understanding the woke faith. You're only uh, the, the view is that society is structured. What is structure? Structure is the dialectical synthesis because the dialectical faith of the superstructure and the infrastructure. The infrastructure is what Marx called the base. It's how society is actually produ produces everything that it needs to produce, whether that's material or whether it's cultural products that give it its foundation. The superstructure is the realm of uh, all the grifters who are in the kind of managerial class or the exploitative class or the bourgeoisie or whatever, who are going to take those infrastructural products and distribute them for their own profit. If we go back to the Marxian theology, what they are are the people who steal the spiritual aspect of the work from the productive workers who are doing the work to create the world and thus to renew themselves and humanity into social man. And they are for them, they're the demons who are taking off like a fragment of that whole and reproducing it in, in microcosm for their own profit. And so they're very evil. So they create the, the, the superstructure creates these ideologies justifying why they get to do it. But they also, the, di the dialectical interplay between the superstructure and the infrastructure produces the structure, which are the relations of society, how people relate to one another, how they relate to power, how they relate to their position, how they, their positionality and intersectionality. Now that all of this works, they create this structure that actually orders society. And like I said, within the doctrine of, of structural determinism determines your character determines what your range of what you can know. It de determines the limits of your subjectivity, determines the, and remember in Marxist theology, your subjectivity is actually arbitrarily limited by the social relations and the structure of society that it puts, but it actually in reality, theologically is unlimited. And so that you could create the entire reality that you wanted, except that you're limited by the social relations that are created by all the other dumb fuck people around you who aren't doing what you want them to do. That's why they all have to be exactly on the same page. And so agency for Marxists, just like their definition of truth, holds that it's true if it moves Marxian theory. And if their definition of good is that it's good if it advances Marxian theory, their definition of agency is that you are actually only acting as an agent if you are moving Marxian theory. And so Freire's work is a discourse developing uh, is de uh, in Freire's work is a discourse that develops a bridge or that bridges the relationship between agency and structure, a discourse that situates human action in constraints forged in historical and contemporary practices. In other words, historical are all the social relations up to this point, the progress of history and contemporary practices are the social relate or what create the social relations of now. Those limit your subjectivity. Your subjectivity is what creates the world that you inhabit and in the perfect liberated utopia, it creates the perfect world in which you're perfectly free, completely emancipated from all such structures. 
while also pointing, he says, to the spaces, contradictions, and forms of resistance that raise the possibility for social structure. So it's telling us where and on what and how we can engage in this activism that is the practice, which is the theory-informed activity that moves society in the dialectical Marxist trajectory. This is a religion, a crackpot religion about making yourself by making the world, and in the end, making both perfect by making it so that there's no distinction between you, the social man, and the world, which has in it the social society, which social means socialist. I will conclude, Giroux tells us, but there's a lot more here. I will conclude by turning briefly to those theoretical elements in Freire's work that are vital for developing a new language and theoretical foundation for a radical theory of pedagogy, particularly in a North American context. So they've got to develop a new language, no kidding, so that they can trick people like what? Culturally responsive teaching. Social emotional learning is going to be co-opted and it's going to become transformative, blah, 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 blah. Two qualifications must be made before I begin, Drew warns, and I've actually read some of this to you before. First, as will be made clear in this book, Freire's mode of analysis can no longer be dismissed as irrelevant to a North American context. Critics have argued that his experiences with Brazilian peasants do not translate adequately for educators in the advanced industrial uh, countries of the West. Freire makes it clear through the force of his examples and the variety of pedagogical experiences he provides in this book, in other words, anecdotes, that the context for his work is international in scope. Not only does he draw on his experiences in Brazil, he also includes pedagogical discussion based on his work in Chile, Africa, and the United States. Furthermore, he takes as the object of his criticism both adult education and the pedagogical practices of the Catholic Church, social workers, and public education, because they all have to be brought under his model, of course, because he's the prophet, the guru. As he has pointed out repeatedly the object of his analysis and the language he uses is for the oppressed everywhere. His concept of the third world is ideological and political rather than merely geographical. In other words, the idea that developing nations or undeveloped nations, the third world, it's not that they're only that way because of uh, ideological and political impositions by countries that are in the first world. Uh, the, the United States, for example, is to be blamed for countries in the third world not being uh, also like the United States. Same kind of mentality that we kind of run into everywhere with, you know, like, say, the social model of disability that you see in woke disability studies. It's not, in fact, having a disability like being deaf or blind or missing limbs or whatever else. It's not actually having a disability that disables you. It's in fact that society disables you by considering you disabled. It's their fault. So the developing world is only not developed, or the undeveloped world is not developed, because the first world hasn't developed it. But you couldn't have developed it like that, because that would be colonialism. It would be wrong. So it's that you basically just haven't given them the resources so they would magically develop themselves. And it was always political and uh, political and uh, ideological, not geographical, like that you could come in and colonize like that and then steal all their resources, etc. This is the, the constant grievance studies grade analysis that this provides. Anyway, this leads, Drew tells us, to the second qualification. In order to be true to the spirit of Freire's most profound pedagogical beliefs, it must be stated that he would never argue that his work is meant to be adapted in grid-like fashion to any site or pedagogical context. This is the part I've read before when I said he was a guru. What Freire does is provide a meta-language that generates a set of categories and social practices that have to be critically mediated by those who would use them for the insights they might provide in different historical settings and contexts. In other words, it's going to create a pyramid scheme of gurus who, oh, I'm the guru for the Boston area. I'm the guru for the Chicago area. I'm the guru for, for Costa Rica. And I've been in contact with the chief guru, blah, 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 blah. This is why, for example, when they implement a DEI or critical education, whatever, SEL, doesn't matter what it is, when they bring it into a school and then none of it works, they blame the school, not the the guru uh, that did it. So what you have are these entities that come along, consultants, who say your school is racist and if you don't hire us at millions of dollars of taxpayer money usually, uh, bring us in to fix your school, 
then you just want to continue racism. And so then they get hired, they come in, they make the school worse, and they say it wasn't our fault. It's that you didn't do the work right because we actually, another one, this is where you end up with a pyramid scheme, a Ponzi scheme of critical theory. And at the top of this Ponzi pyramid is Paolo Freire with his goofball religion being mediated by his chief evangelist, Henry Giroux. So anyway, uh, so it must be critically mediated by those who would use them for the insights they might provide in different historical settings and contexts, aka grifters. Freire's work is not meant to offer radical recipes for instant forms of critical pedagogy. Rather, is it, a, it is a series of theoretical signposts that need to be decoded and critically appropriated within the specific context in which they might be useful. So Freire was never wrong, and then whoever's right below him was never wrong, and so on and so forth. And it was always, at the end of the day, the people implementing it at the school who are always wrong. No matter, they give you a program to implement, it's supposed to make things better, you're never doing it right. It never makes it better. And that means you need more consulting. It's all a pyramid scheme. It's all a gigantic pyramid scheme. And it's also just a guru based religion. Like I said, it's all crackpot. It's all fake. It's all a grift. It's a, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a grifty religion that, that's being implemented in our schools. And the religion itself is, is literally toxic poison, uh, and horrible, uh, absolute nonsense. So we move on now to more of Giroux. Freire, the next section is titled Freire and the Discourse of Power. He says, Freire provides one of the most dialectical notions of power in contemporary social theory. Power is viewed both as, uh, sorry, as both a negative and a positive force. Its character is, so now all of a sudden we have this idea, wait, no, we can use power because there's a positive side to it when it's moving our agenda, and there's a negative side when it's resisting our agenda. Power is viewed as both a negative and positive force. Its character is dialectical, and its mode of operation is always more than simply repressive. For Freire, power works both on and through people. On the one hand, this means that domination is never so complete that power is experienced exclusively as a negative force. On the other hand, it means that power is at the basis of all forms of behavior in which people resist, struggle, and fight for their image of a better world. So on the one hand, this means that domination is never so complete that power is experienced exclusively as a negative force. So you might think some of this power is positive force. Now, on the other hand, and this is, this is key, this is Robin D'Angelo, it means that power is at the basis of all forms of behavior in which people resist, struggle, and fight for their image of a better world. So you have on the one hand the two way well this is actually saying that power is at the basis for how you fight back. That's what he's clearly saying. Power is at the basis of all forms of behavior in which people resist, struggle, and fight for their image of a better world. But there's two sides to that because people who are resisting Marxist BS say they're doing it for their image of a better world. And so their resistance is actually rooted in power. And then re resistance against the status quo is power. So no, now you have a Marxist theory saying, no, we get to use power. And when people resist us, they're just trying to maintain their power. So you can see where the woke ideology actually flourishes in this Freirean theory. In a general sense, he tells us Freire's theory of power and his demonstration of its dialectical character serve the important function of broadening the terrain on which it operates. Power in this instance is not exhausted in those public and private spheres where governments, ruling classes, and other dominant groups operate. It is more ubiquitous and is expressed in a range of oppositional public spaces and spheres that traditionally have been characterized by the absence of power and thus any form of resistance. So power is operating everywhere, through everybody, in every corner, including that people are imposing power on themselves, etc. In fact, that's kind of what they think the belief in God is about, is that you're imposing this. Pe this is a big thing in Freire, as he says, well, the peasants accept that God just said that this is the way that it is or whatever. So they accept their own domination. And in fact, they impose their own domination upon themselves. Uh, and that's why they need to be awakened to the conscience, the consciousness. They need to be uh, conscientized or whatever the verb form of that is uh, that he uses um, so that they will be aware that they're doing this and stop doing it. Uh, Freire's view of power suggests not only an alternative perspective to those radical theorists trapped in the straitjacket of despair and cynicism, so your European neo-Marxists, for example, 
Uh, it also stresses that there are always cracks, tensions, and contradictions in various social spheres, such as schools, where power is often exercised as a positive force in the name of resistance. Furthermore, Freire understands that power as a form of domination is not simply something imposed by the state through agencies such as the police, the army, and the courts. That's obviously something Marcuse says a lot, and this is a subtle critique of Marcuse uh, from Giroux. Saying Freire gets it better. He understands it better. He says domination is also expressed by the way in which power, technology, and ideology come together to produce forms of knowledge, social relations, and other concrete cultural forms that function to actively silence people. But the subtlety of domination, Drew tells us, is not exhausted by simply referring to those cultural, cultural forms that bear down on the oppressed daily, so you can't just name racism. It is also to be found in the way in which the oppressed internalize and thus participate in their own oppression. Internalized sexism, internalized racism, internalized transphobia, blah, 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 blah. This is an important point in Freire's work and indicates the ways in which domination is subjectively experienced through its internalization and sedimentation in the very needs of the personality. This is why Freire's work as a, like as a religious prophet is that the, the revolution is inside you. The spiritual renewal occurs inside you. Um, what does it work here in Freire's thought is an important attempt to examine the physically repressive aspects of domination and hence the possible internal obstacles to self-knowledge and thus to forms of social and self-emancipation. Hence, we're always doing the work internally now. We're always interrogating our own racism, etc. That's the woke thing. This is where wokeness comes from. Remember, this is liberation theology repackaged into this Marx, more explicitly Marxist but educational form, and it's the basis of what's going on in our schools. You have to be doing the work in yourself, and you hear this constantly from educators and activists that are pushing this stuff, or activist educators, really. There are no, these are activists posing as educators. They're not actually educators. They're, they're terrible people. Terrible people. Um, terrible people. So Freire's notion of domination and how power works repressively on the psyche broadens the notion of learning to include how the body learns tacitly, how habit translates into sedimented history, and how knowledge itself may block the development of certain subjectivities and ways of experiencing the world. Knowledge itself may block the development of certain subjectivities, like false ones, and ways of experiencing the world. Uh, so knowledge blocks the development of ways of experiencing the world. What would those ways of experiencing the world be if knowledge is blocking them? Narrative-based fictional ones. That's what. Woe is me stories, maybe. This person, well, here's an example. Black Lives Matter, all this murder of unarmed black people by police. Well, how many were there? Like less than 20. Yeah, but it feels like we experience that it's happening to us every day. Knowledge that it's like less than 20 people might block the development of certain subjectivities and ways of experiencing the world. This perception of knowledge is important because it points to a radically different conception of how emancipatory forms of knowledge may be refused by those who could benefit most from them. So you could give them emanci whatever emancipatory forms of knowledge are, the, the other knowledge might prevent them, like actual knowledge might prevent them from accepting the radical nonsense that they're being fed. In this case, the oppressed people's accommodation to the logic of domination may take the form of actively resisting forms of knowledge that pose a challenge to their worldview. Rather than being a passive acceptance of domination, this form of knowledge becomes instead an active dynamic of negation, an active refusal to listen, to hear, or to affirm one's possibilities. So you can see where these actually got, it seems like a point, or is a point, that you could try to come to the poor peasant, for example, in Brazil, and you could tell him, you know, you could actually have your own thing, you could be the boss. And he says, no, no, I'm just a lowly peasant, I can't, it couldn't possibly be that, blah, blah, blah. Or that we could have a totally different society. No, no, we can't have a different society. This is just the way it is. We need police. We need, we need prisons. We need, uh, uh, you know, landlords and so on. You can't even imagine a different way of life. You can see where well, that's what he's talking about. You, this is this um, 
this form of knowledge, he says, becomes an active dynamic of negation, an active refusal to listen to hear or to affirm one's possibilities of a communist utopia. The pedagogical question that emerges from this, so you can see there's this two things, right? There's some of these things are real, like, no, really, like if you've ever had a kid who's not like, who doesn't understand their own potential or whatever, won't take advantage of it. You, you can relate because you're like, no, really, like just go start doing stuff and you'll get better at it and then you'll be good at it and then you'll have something kind of parable of the talents kind of way or whatever. And then they're like, no, no, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And anybody who's got a self-defeating attitude, like there's, so there's this point where you can reach a self-defeating attitude and try to break through it and that would actually be good and that's being capitalized upon to be turned into we need to have a whole communist revolution and that's what freire does he has this point in the pedagogy of the oppressed where it's not super super explicit but it's pretty clear that what he's talking about is that you get the peasant to recognize his dependency and let's say that he recognizes his dependency and he's awakened to his dependency which maybe that's a good kind of liberatory consciousness or whatever and then you you have actually at that point have a choice. The choice is that you can teach him. You have two paths. You can teach him that if you become responsible, parable of the talents from the Bible style, um, then you can actually become uh, a master of many things. For example, to echo the parable. On the other hand, you can take the road that Freire advocates, which is you can collectivize and overthrow the whole society that kept you dependent. And so it's not you can work within the existing system to become somebody who is successful and that really anybody who wants to take command of their own life can do that, which is called responsibility. There is instead the path of the society is the thing that's been breaking you. So let's break the society, which is called resentment. And so once you realize you awaken somebody to the fact that they are in a position, a bad position that they don't necessarily they're not actually trapped in, which I would say is the limit of the positive aspect of this. You then hit a crossroads you have, or a fork in the road. You have two different directions you can take. And one is the road to responsibility sets you free. The other is the road to, uh, to resentment and that freedom comes from tearing the whole thing down and being a Marxist. And Freire advocates, of course, the Marxist road, which is resentment and tear the whole thing down. So it's an anti-responsibility liberation theology that they're teaching. How horrible, how horrible. And this is, like I said, this right in the pedagogy of the oppressed. We'll get to that eventually. Um, and that's what Giroux is praising here in the work of Freire. So the pedagogy, so there's also though, I wanted to drag that out because I want to point out that trick. There is this idea that, yeah, you can awaken to somebody that they're not listening to the actualities of their circumstances or the actualities of the possibilities in their circumstances. But then you have two roads you can take from there, one of responsibility and one of resentment. And Freire's is collectivism and resentment versus individualism and responsibility. And you can see that that is the key problem here. That is the key problem here. And that's the, the key difference between the free West and the Marxist shithole. Um, and you know where this is going, and this is what Drew is supporting. Uh, Drew goes on and says, the pedagogical question that emerges from this view of domination is, how do radical educators assess and address the elements of repression and forgetting at the heart of this type of domination? What accounts for the conditions that sustain an active refusal to know or to learn in the face of knowledge that may challenge the nature of domination itself? Well, it's not self-doubt, it's that the, which is what I'm saying between responsibility and resentment. It's not self-doubt, which is on the pathway, that's the gate barring the way to the road of responsibility. It's instead uh, that the society itself is oppressing you, it's the society holding you down, and that's the gateway to, which is wide open to, um, to the path of resentment. It's the social conditions. It's not me. If we could just overthrow the social conditions, it wouldn't just be, and also, you know, you can frame it out. It'd be selfish of you to not get the shot, for example. It'd be selfish of you to take responsibility and raise yourself out of poverty, to get out of the ghetto, to leave the mountain, if we want to talk about black urban problems or Appalachian uh, mountain problems, uh, or like I said, the, the, the shot problems. It would be selfish of you to raise yourself up when you could be trying to liberate everybody along with you in solidarity. So let's go find more people to make resentful instead of teaching anybody to become responsible. That's the path 
that they're talking about. What accounts for the conditions, Drew writes, that sustain an active refusal to know or to learn in the face of knowledge that may challenge the nature of domination itself. You wouldn't want to go take responsibility and become a boss because then you would just become part of the problem that's oppressing all these other people, all your friends, all these people that you live with, they're going to be oppressed. And if you leave the ghetto, then you just left them behind to rot. If you leave the mountain, you betrayed your family. That's the poisonous mentality, collective failure. And you have a responsibility to that. That's a poisonous mentality. The message that emerges from Freire's pedagogy is relatively clear. If radical educators are to understand the meaning of liberation, it's communism, by the way, they must first be aware of the form the domination takes, the nature of its location, and the problems it poses for those who experience it as both a subjective and objective force. But such a project would be impossible unless one took the historical and cultural particularities, the forms of social life of subordinate and oppressed groups as a starting point for such analysis. It is to this issue in Freire's work that I will now turn. Freire's section, this is a new section, Freire's philosophy of experience and cultural production. One of the most important theoretical elements for a radical pedagogy. Remember, this is what's going on in our schools that Freire provides is his view of expertise and cultural production. You remember how many times I've said, and other people have said, Mike Nana, I think, was the first person I heard actually say it, that the point of, he said it was post postmodernism, but this is wokeness, and it is um, all of cultural Marxism, and it's all of uh, ooh, critical Marxism, really, too, is that they seize the, they seek not to seize the means of material production, but to seize the means of cultural production. Uh, and so now one of the most important theoretical elements for a radical pedagogy that Freire provides is his view of experience and cultural production. Freire's notion of culture is at odds with both conservative and progressive positions. In the first instance, he rejects the notion that culture can simply be divided into its high, popular, and low forms. That's a shot. That's an arrow shot right at the the. the neo-Marxists, but also at conservatives who say, well, there's high culture and that's good. There's low culture and then there's popular culture. And the neo-Marxists said that popular culture was actually uh, keeping the, it was like a, a the culture industry produced popular culture to commodify uh, high culture and sell it to low culture so that they wouldn't actually have interest in high culture and would keep them satisfied though and keep them down. Uh, so with high culture representing the most advanced heritage of a nation, culture in this view hides the ideologies that legitimate and distribute specific forms of culture as if they were unrelated to ruling class interests and existing configurations of power. So that's the neo-Marxist thing I just actually talked about. Culture in this view it hides the ideologies. So the people who have access to the upper echelons of society, the bourgeoisie or whatever you want to call them, the superstructuralists, if you will, produce rationalizations and justifications for why the society is the way that it is. But those are really justifications for why they get to be on top and why other people have to stay down. They are the country club. They're the the, the lists of the rules of what allows you into the country club of upper class, being that cultural class or economic class versus lower class. And they, they have these ideas like, oh, well, merit, I worked for it. That's an ideology. Uh, it's human nature to want to succeed. That's an ideology. Uh, you know, there's lots of these things. Objectivity. I can, I have an objective position. That's an ideology that they hate. So that culture hides the ideologies that legitimate and distribute specific forms of culture as if they were unrelated to ruling class interests and existing configurations of power. Okay, so specific forms of culture maybe classical music or whatever, Beethoven's racist, right? Uh, are actually, they are actually related to ruling class interests and the existing configurations of power. You wouldn't understand Beethoven, da, 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 you have to stay out. You can't come to the symphony. You don't know how to dress. You don't know how to eat with the forks the right way. You can't come to the nice restaurant. Culture hides the ideologies being uh, what, what justifications we have for being in this higher position that legitimate and distribute specific forms of culture as if they were unrelated to ruling class interests and existing configurations of power. And remember, the neo-Marxist critique was that popular culture commodifies high culture and sells a simulated version of it to 
the lower class to keep them happy, to make them think that they have nice stuff when really what they're getting sold is a commodity form that's garbage. That's basically neo-Marxism and postmodernism all kind of wrapped up as what they're obsessed about. In the second instance, he rejects the notion that the moment of cultural creation rests solely with dominant groups and that these cultural forms harbor merely the seeds of domination. Related to this position, and also rejected by Freire, is the assumption that the that oppressed groups possess by their very location in the apparatus of domination a progressive and revolutionary culture that is simply that simply has to be released from the fetters of ruling class domination. So the Marxists and neo-Marxists assumed that if you just awakened the lower class to their their oppression, that they would naturally become revolutionary. And Freire says, no, 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 no. That's not enough. They have to have a consciousness awakened in them in a really deep and prof- profound way. You can't simply strip away the aspects of the ruling class domination. You have to actually show them that the ruling class domination is happening to them and get them to resent it. That's when they awaken. They don't just awaken by taking off the fetters, by uh, getting them to, to stop engaging in popular culture or whatever else, or to realize that they're... Um, you know, a, a solid, a working class with solidarity. That's not enough. So you actually have to get inside and conscientious, uh, it's conscientization. Uh, you have to wake them up that way in a completely different way. So, and then that's where, you know, this is where that kind of like internal spiritual renewal aspect comes into the Freirean hope driven theology within Marxism, which again, by the way, don't lose sight. This all got repackaged up as education because Paulo Freire said everything is in, in education, and then it got brought into education. For Freire, culture is the representation of lived experiences, material artifacts, and practices forged within the unequal and dialectical relations that different groups establish within a given society at a particular point in historical time. That's a complicated idea. Culture is a representation of lived experiences, material artifacts, and practices forged within. So the power dynamics forge them. The social relations of the moment forge them. Forged within the unequal, and these are dialectical relations, the different groups established within a given society at a particular point in historical time. This is why you can't have cultural appropriation. Because... The group being oppressed forged whatever practices, apparently having tacos for Taco Tuesday, I love that example, or wearing particular clothing or whatever, or having particular styles of music or dress or activity or speech. They formed that because of the power dynamics imposed upon them, structurally determining them, the unequal and dialectical relations that different groups establish from one group to another, to another, to another, how everybody treats. And so that product is a unique response or result of those dynamics on that group. And then for another group to swoop in and say, no, we're going to have taco Tuesday at the school. That's white people appropriating tacos and stealing that from them. Or a white woman deciding to wear a chi pao or a chang sum to, you know, prom. That's going to be a problem because that, style of cultural expression was forged under certain circumstances that you had no, you have no right to take from them. Culture, he says, is a form of production whose processes are intimately connected with the structuring of different social formations, particularly those that are related to gender, age, race, and class. Age is going to be mentioned here a lot, by the way, because um, schooling. So, Adult versus child is what that's really going to tap into. So culture is a form of production whose processes are intimately connected with the structuring of different social formations. So remember, structuring is something that's happening because of the relationship between the powerful and the dispossessed and dialectical relationship creating the structures of society like racism or sexism or whatever that are its operating principles. Culture is... Uh, is intimately connected to that. The production of culture is intimately protected, uh, uh, connected to that, particularly those related to gender, age, race, and class. It is also like if I say things like based or, you know, whatever the, the, the young slang of the day is as a, as a currently as an old, um, that I'm actually, you know, being very cringe, apparently. It is also a form of production that helps human agents to trans culture is also a form of production that helps 
human agents to transform society through their use of language and other material resources. In this case, culture is intimately related to the dynamics of power and produces asymmetries in the ability of individuals and groups to define and achieve their goals. Furthermore, well, what does that mean? How does culture uh, inherently relate to the dynamics of power and that produces asymmetries in the ability of individuals and groups to define and achieve their goals? Well, this is very crucial to education. Standard American English, for example, uh, is a cultural artifact in this view that represses, say, uh, African American vernacular English or Ebonics, as it once was called. Um, and you see this fight over linguistic justice within the woke education circles. They want to create, uh, they want to do away with all of these standards. Why? Because those are uh, cultural impositions. Why are they awkwardly teaching black kids to rap about? stuff in school because they have to be related to in terms of their culturally responsive practices. Why? Because culture is intimately related to the dynamics of power and produces asymmetries. Rap is looked with looked upon with disdain from white supremacy culture. And so we're going to do that because uh, it's um, says, uh, where, where was it? Uh, it's a form of production that helps human agents to transform society through the use of language and other, re other resources. Furthermore, culture is also a terrain of struggle and contradictions. And there is no one culture in the homogenous sense. On the contrary, there are dominant and subordinate cultures. Those are going to be in dialectical relationship, of course. There are dominant and subordinate cultures that express different interests and operate from different and unequal terrains of power. And of course, they would say that these inequalities have nothing to do with anything except arbitrary applications of power that must be fought and resisted and ultimately overthrown to achieve liberation. Freire, he says, argues for a notion of cultural power that takes as its starting point the social and historical particularities, the problems, sufferings, visions, and acts of resistance that constitute the cultural forms of subordinate groups. So cultural power starts within the huge amount of Marxist analysis you could possibly apply to subordinate groups. Freire's notion of cultural power has a dual focus as part of his strategy to make the political more pedagogical. So all of a sudden, politics becomes an educational tool. First, he argues that educators have to work with the experiences that students, adults, and other learners bring to schools and other educational sites, culturally responsive teaching. This means making these experiences and their public and private forms the object of debate, debate and confirmation. So now you're going to be arguing about the meaning of lived experiences from a position where uh, intersectional positionality becomes the dominant lens through understanding those things means making these experiences in their public and private forms the object of debate and confirmation. That's supposed to happen in education under Freire's program, as Giroux has it. It means legitimating such experiences, yeah, because you must legitimate an experience, otherwise you would be silencing people, which they can't just be wrong. You're just silencing them from your cultural perspective by imposing it on them. It means legitimating such experiences in order to give those who live and move within them a sense of affirmation and provide the conditions for students and others to display an active voice and presence. Does that not sound exact? That long sentence right there with a semicolon in the middle is exactly the backwards ass approach to education that's destroying everything. That's all our education program is about. Remember, this is all because it's socialist in nature or communist in nature. All of this has to be with the objective of creating social man, of creating socialist man, of awakening critical consciousness, in other words. So let me just read that backwards ass transformation of our education again one more time. This means making these experiences in their public and private forms the object of debate and confirmation. It means legitimating such experiences in order to give those who live and move within them a sense of affirmation and to provide the conditions for students and others to display an active voice and presence. Now let me take a sidebar to that real quick because affirmation is a word that shows up in the gender and queer and trans literature and activism constantly. Affirmation, gender affirming surgery, af everything has to be gender affirming, identity affirming. What does that mean? It means double mastectomies for 13 year old girls who've been affirmed by adult groomers who had no business doing that. That's what it means. 
And this is exactly what's happening in schools. Schools are doing gender affirming activity often for months without parents knowing that it's happening to great damage. Parents being shocked and angry nine, 10 months into this when they find out that the school has been doing this and has been legally authorized to not have to tell parents. Why is this happening? Because of this shit. It means legitimating such experiences. I feel like a boy. In order to give those who live and move within them a sense of affirmation, in other words, to coddle their feelings, regardless of where they actually come from, regardless of the fact that they might be manufactured as a means of escaping the constant identity bullying, constant identity bashing that's coming along with having, say, a white female identity in schools under critical race theory. Then queer theory gives them a new kind of identity, sexual or gender or otherwise, and you have to practice legitimating those experiences in order to give those who live and move within them a sense of affirmation. Why? Because it provides the conditions for students and others to display an active voice and presence. Sounds really nice when you say it that way, and it means 13-year-olds cutting their tits off. They're not growing back. It's what it means. It means 13-year-olds taking hormones until their bodies go into revolt. It means permanent damage. That's just one thing. It also means turning race into a a political football. It means teaching kids to embrace their oppression as a site of subjectivity. It means teaching white kids to feel guilty for what their ancestors might not even have done because they happen to have the same skin color as people whose ancestors may have done it. It's a horrific practice. Affirmation. Affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. As if a seven-year-old or a 13-year-old might not be dramatizing something or wrong about something or need some actual guidance and boundaries uh, and structure and shape to their life to understand what they're going through. Puberty's complicated. So yeah, we're just going to affirm whatever thing they read on fucking Tumblr, whether it's cutting themselves, whether it's transition, whether it's pro-anorexia, we're just going to affirm that. These people are fucking nut jobs. The pedagogical experiences here, I'm sorry, I'm, I gotta, I can't even finish this paragraph here. The pedagogical experience here, become, it's so nice when you read it, if you don't know what you're actually, what they're actually condoning. The pedagogical experience here becomes an invitation to make visible the languages, dreams, values, and encounters that constitute the lives of those whose histories are often actively silenced. Languages dreams, values, and encounters, like getting sexually groomed into a uh, sexual relationship with a pervert in your school. There's an encounter. Dreams. I dream that I can be a boy when I'm a girl. There's a dream. Why? Because their histories are actively silenced. Their histories are actively silenced. But Freire, this is where woke came from. Freire is really the key here, by the way and Drew, who brought him in. But for these people have so much, so much evil hanging on their heads. But Freire does more than argue for the legitimation of the culture of the oppressed. He also recognizes that such experiences are contradictory in nature and harbor not only radical potentialities, but also the, sediment, the sedimentations of domination. Oh no, they're contradictory in nature. There's a dialectic there. You might actually just become... a uh, grievous, and therefore you might not become a radical. You might just become somebody who decides to find a way to reproduce domination on somebody else, and therefore you're never, ever, 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 ever going to do it right. You have to implement this, and you're never going to do it right, so you have to hire the consultant again, and the Ponzi scheme keeps on rolling. So much of this crap, all of this critical pedagogy crap, every bit of critical pedagogy, every bit of it that's ever been pushed onto a school system by a freaking consultant using this garbage, every bit of it has been a fraud and every single taxpayer probably has a right to an untold amount of money back from the federal government and state government and local government by suing for consumer protection for these frauds, for this racketeering, this whole Ponzi scheme of ripping and people off and grifting using the, 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 the most, some of the most unfortunate in challenging stories with troubled kids or gay kids or whatever, racial kids or whatever other kids as the proxy for implementing this total fraud. 
in the form of this nasty Marxism that's a horrific idea because these lunatic religionists think that they're producing the utopia because they see the utopia merely as the possibility that we might have a perfect world, a kingdom of God on earth, as he said. Cultural power, we're told, takes a twist in this instance and refers to the need to work on, that's in italics, the experiences that make up the lives of the oppressed. Work on is in italics. The work is the charge, the practice, the theory-driven practice of the Marxian faith. It refer, cultural power refers to the need to do the work on the experiences that make up the lives of the oppressed. In other words, to turn them into Marxist interpretation. That's all they do. That's the work they constantly talk about. Cultural power refers to the need to work on the experiences that make up the lives of the oppressed. This means that such experiences and their varied cultural forms have to be recovered critically, turned into critical theory, I just said, to be turned into Marxism, in order to reveal both their strengths and weaknesses. Moreover, this means that self-critique is complemented in the name of a radical pedagogy designed to unearth and critically appropriate those unclaimed emancipatory moments in bourgeois knowledge and experience that further provide the skills the oppressed will need to exercise leadership in the dominant society. What's striking in this view is that Freire has fashioned a theory of cultural power and production that begins with the notion of popular education. Instead of beginning with abstract generalities about human nature, he rightly argues for the pedagogical principles that arise from the concrete practices that constitute the terrains on which people live out their problems, hopes, and everyday experiences. All of this suggests taking seriously the cultural capital of the oppressed, developing critical and analytical tools to interrogate it, and staying in touch with dominant definitions of knowledge so we can analyze them for their usefulness and for the ways in which they bear the logic of domination. So in other words, how they can steal tools from the existing society that they hate and put them to use against that society uh, to turn everything Marxist through your kids. Next section is resistant intellectuals and the theory practice relationship. And we've talked in the past on the podcast about the theory practice relationship being absolutely intrinsic to Marxism. Theory and practice are said to have been separated by the division of labor by Marx so that uh, property holders and owners um, and capitalists are taking your practice, which is all of your life activity, uh, and separating it from theory. Uh, in other words, they're separating your ability to create spiritual renewal and see yourself as a creator uh, by making you work for them instead. And it all happens through property ownership because then one person can make another person work in terms of their property or whatever, or keep them out of their property. And so the theory practice relationship is extremely important. There is no such thing as actual practice or actual work or the work unless it is informed by theory. The only legitimate work is the work, which is the work of spiritual renewal, as we just talked about, that happens by applying critical theory or critical Marxism or Marxist theory of one kind or another or woke Marxism, it doesn't matter which one, to the activity that you're undertaking. When somebody steals it, it becomes labor This was ex it, that's exploiting you. When you do it, it is practice and the work. And when you do it without any intention, uh, because uh, it, that, that's activity. That's that's the, the stuff of animals. And that's what labor is reducing your practice and work to. So Marxist theory has to guide every single possible activity in the Marxist religion. You must understand that that's what this is about. So what does Giroux tell us about resistant intellectuals in the theory practice relationship? He says that radical social theory has been plagued historically by the relationship between intellectuals and the masses. On the one hand, and the relationship between the forms of theory and practice on which it has been modeled on the other. Under the call for the unity of theory and practice, that's the chief goal of creating the Marxist utopia, the unity of theory of practice and theory and practice, the possibility for emancipatory practice has often been negated through forms of vanguardism in which intellectuals virtually removed from the popular forces by the ability to define themselves the limits, sorry, define for themselves the limits of their aims and practice. 
So certain intellectuals are going to say this is the way that it is, and they become the gurus. This is actually, uh, let me see, let's just read it again. The possibility for emancipatory practice has often been negated through forms of vanguardism. That's what, that's what Lenin did. The Bolsheviks were, were vanguard. They were the elite intellectuals who understood the theory, and even though they were in the bourgeois class themselves, they were going to lead the proletariat through the revolution, and then it was all going to be great. Um, so these are intellectuals. He says they were virtually removed from the popular forces. These are the the very smart people who are trying to communicate, but it's not the very smart people who would be against the theory. It's very far, smart people who are for the theory, but they're not really for the theory. And so what this does is it enables um, them to select people. Uh, who are the legitimate carriers of the of theory and practice from within uh, the people that they're grooming. In other words, it's also setting up the stage where you have to have the right identity in order to be able to speak authentically from that identity within woke politics. So woke Marxism, this again, Freire is the prophet of woke Marxism. By assuming a virtual monopoly in the exercise of theoretical leadership, intellectuals unknowingly often reproduced the division of mental and manual labor that was at the core of most forms of domination. That's straight Marxism. Instead of developing theories of practice rooted in the concrete experience of listening and learning with the oppressed, Marxist intellectuals often developed theories for practice or technical instruments for change that ignored the necessity for a dialectical reflection on the everyday dynamics and problems of the oppressed within the context of radical social transformation. So now they can tell you that you, if it doesn't work when you try to apply the theory they told you to, to apply, it was your fault because you didn't listen enough or you set yourself up as an ally who knows better and speaks over and speaks for all this crap where the woke are constantly saying that it's always done wrong is all set up right here. And that's, of course, what he's telling us is a key aspect of Freire's work. In fact, he says Freire's work refutes this approach to the theory-practice relationship and redefines the very notion of the intellectual. Like the Italian social theorist Antonio Gramsci, Freire redefines the category of intellectual and argues that all men and women are intellectuals. That is, regardless of one's social and economic function, all human beings perform as intellectuals by constantly interpreting and giving meaning to the world and by participating in a particular conception of the world. That's, again, your straight subjectivist Marxist theory that everybody's an intellectual, everybody is actually creating the world in their head by constantly interpreting and giving meaning to the world, giving meaning to the world. They are creating what the world actually is. They are all actually individual. They are all actually into intellectuals. So somebody who has lived experience is now on par with somebody who has studied the issue uh, carefully. For example, moreover, the oppressed need to develop their own organic and resistant intellectuals. That's a very Gramscian idea. Who can learn with such groups while simultaneously helping them to foster modes of self-education and struggle against various forms of oppression. In this case, intellectuals are organic in that they are not outsiders bringing theory to the masses. On the contrary, they are theorists fused organically with the culture and practical activities of the oppressed. So we don't need, as Ayanna Presley said, we don't need black faces who don't want to be black voices. So the theory is giving us what black voice is, the unique voice of color, critical race theory talks about. We need black faces who are actually speaking it, for example. Um, intellectuals are organic and they are not in that they are not outsiders bringing the theory. They're not the people who studied what's going on and bringing it to. They are people within it and we must listen and learn from the oppressed. This is where woke comes from. Rather than casually dispense knowledge to the grateful masses, intellectuals fuse with the oppressed in order to make and remake the conditions necessary for a radical social project. Not to do anything else, but rather to make the conditions necessary for a revolution, a radical social project. This position is crucially important in highlighting the political function and importance of intellectuals. Equally significant is the way it redefines the notion of political struggle by emphasizing its pedagogical nature and the centrality of the popular and democratic nature of such a struggle. This raises the important question of how Freire defines the relationship between theory and practice. And so again, what we're going to have now is we're going to have that uh, somebody who has the lived experience of, say, being 
are murdered every day in the street by police, even though it's not really happening, becomes an intellectual authority. And that's only going to be uh, comprehensible when we understand the relationship between theory and practice, where again, theory is Marxian theory. Uh, so this is where we're going to understand who gets to become, say, a black voice or a trans voice or whatever. And it's going to be, of course, the people with the radical politics, isn't it? For Freire, quote, there is no theoretical context if it is not in a dialectical unity with the concrete context, end quote. Rather than call for the collapse of theory into practice, Freire argues for a certain distance between theory and practice. He views theory as anticipatory in its nature and argues that it must take the concepts of understanding and possibility as its central moments. Understanding and possibility. So what's going on and what possibly could come out of it? Very activist theory, but this di there's no theoretical context. This is the th Freire quote here. If it is not in dialectical unity with the concrete context, so theory and what's actually happening, you what, what this what this is saying is that you actually have to create a synthetic resolution to what you're actually seeing happening and what theory says is going on. In other words, you have to interpret everything through theory, which is exactly what woke demands. That's what doing the work is all about. Uh, where did I go? So the tension indeed, oops, I skipped a sentence. Theory, he says, is informed by an oppositional discourse that preserves its critical distance from the facts and experiences of a given society. The tension, indeed, the conflict with practice belongs to the essence of theory and is grounded in its very structure. Theory does not dictate practice. Rather, it serves to uphold practice at arm's length in order to mediate and critically comprehend the type of praxis needed within a specific setting at a particular time in history. So in other words, the, the wheel here is that you have theory, action, reflection. That's the dialectical relationship of praxis. You have theory, action, or practice, theory, practice, reflection. And so what Freire is saying is what I get from Marx when he's still at his most Hegelian, who is, remember, speculative, which means analyzing society as though looking in a mirror, because speculative means speculum, which means mirror in Latin. And so what he's saying is that theory is like the mirror in which you have, you have practice, and then you reflect on it. How? By looking in the mirror of theory. And then you have practice again that's more actual practice or praxis because you've looked into the mirror of theory and then you theory, action, reflection, theory, action, reflection, theory, action, reflection, around and around it goes. And so he says you have to have theory at arm's length and that's what you're using as the mirror to interpret what you're seeing happen through your, your activism. So you do activism and you look into the mirror and reflect upon that and the mirror is theory and then you have more activism. And it's going to be in key. It's going to be, uh, it does not dictate practice. It says um, it, to mediate and critically comprehend the type of praxis needed within a specific setting at a particular time in history. So you're constantly looking at how theory is interpreting the moment of history and you're going and in the context that you're in. This is why, <clears throat> this is why Freire is such a guru because he can always say that if you didn't, if you didn't, if it didn't work, you didn't get it right. You didn't reflect right. You didn't get your theory right. You didn't get your practice right or something. You didn't reflect enough. Your praxis was off and the Ponzi scheme carries on. That's what the consultants constantly do. There is no appeal to universal laws or historical necessity here. Giroux says theory emerges from specific contexts and forms of experience in order to examine such context critically and then to intervene on the basis of informed praxis, which is what I just said. Stuff is happening. You use critical theory to understand it. Then you intervene according to what critical theory tells you would be the thing to do there, which is probably call it racist. But Freire's contribution to the nature of theory and practice and to understanding the role of the intellectual in the process of social transformation contains another important dimension. Freire argues that theory must be seen as the production of forms of discourse that arise from various specific social sites. A discourse may arise from the universities, from peasant communities, from workers' councils, or from various social movements. The issue here is that radical educators recognize that these different sites give rise to various forms of theoretical production and practice, and that each of these sites provides diverse and critical insights into the nature of domination and the possibilities for social and self-emancipation, and they do so from the historical and social particularities that give them meaning. 
What brings them together is a mutual respect forged in criticism and the need to struggle against all forms of domination. And so what he's saying here is the personal is political, the struggle is internal, the struggle is wherever you are, everything is a teaching moment, and the tool by which you will learn is critical theory that must be applied to every single possible context within yourself. And that's going to be the basis for critical hope. Freire, this is still Giroux, this next section, Freire and the concept of historical insertion. Freire believes that a critical sensibility is an extension of a historical sensibility. That is, to understand the present in both institutional and social terms, educators must place all pedagogical contexts in a historical context, that means a Marxist context, in order to see clearly their genesis and development. History, remember, history for Marxists is the history of social relations. It is the history of how people dominated other people in that given context. It's not what happened last week. It's not what happened four, four years ago. It is how people dominated one another up to this point in this context. So educators must place all pedagogical context in a historical context in order to see clearly their genesis and development. In other words, you have to turn them into Marxist analysis. History is used by Freire in a twofold sense. On the one hand, it reveals in existing institutions and social relations the historical context that informs their meaning and the legacy that both hides and clarifies their political function. On the other hand, Freire points to the sedimented history that constitutes who we are as, a his as historical and social beings. In other words, the history that is anchored in the cultural forms that give meaning to the way we talk, think, dress, and act becomes subject to a form of historical analysis. So everything, how do we dress, how do we think, how do we talk, how do we act, what do we eat, etc., becomes subject to a form of critical analysis. He says historical analysis, but what that means is an analysis that looks at how oppression and the dominant versus oppressed hierarchy has shaped everything in that context up to that moment. How did white people coming over and being in the Mexican-American War shape the relationships between America or through white people and uh, Mexican people that led to the production of the burrito? Uh, seriously, that how have white people oppressing Mexicans led to the to, or led to the construction of the burrito would be something that you actually would have to, to do. Why? Why do we have this? Why do people dress this way? Why do people act this way? Why do people talk this way? And it all has to be analyzed in terms of constant social relations as, and all of the, the sins and injuries of history. This is, of course, key to understanding what woke is all about. Freire is the woke prophet. I'll say it again. History, in this sense, becomes dialectical in Freire's work because it is used to distinguish between the present as given and the present as containing emancipatory possibilities. And this is really big. This is the utopian thing. For Freire, a lot of people would say, well, what happened is what happened. It is what it is, blah, blah, blah. What Freire is saying is what happened has happened, and it is the seed by which we can see a step toward emancipation. It is a, a critical moment, a teaching moment. There's a critical theory involved in every single aspect of what's going on. That's why we, we see um, everything, what Freire brings to the table is that everything becomes the opportunity to have a have critical theory applied to it, which is, of course, what Woke does. It applies it to literally everything. It applies critical theory to literally everything. Um, we can't accept the present as given. We have to see the present, which means all the history that led up to that moment, and meaning the history of social relations and domination and oppression that led up to that moment, as containing the possibility to create emancipation or liber liberation as communism. This perspective makes the present as it constitutes our psyche in the wider social, uh, wider society. Vi Let me say, say that again because I stumbled. This perspective makes the present as it constitutes our psyche and the wider society visible in terms of its revolutionary possibilities, and in doing so, points to the need for a critical awakening, what Freire calls the process of denunciation and annunciation. That's actually going to be big as we go through this book that is grounded in the capacity for social transformation. Okay, so what it's saying here, um, this perspective makes the present as it constitutes our psyche and wider society, 
Why? Because wider society is our psyche and our psyche is creating wider society because that's the Marxist view, it's subjectivist in nature. Um, it's what makes it visible in terms of its rev revolutionary possibilities. And so we're constantly looking for, in whatever the present moment gives us, the capacity to do some kind of radical revolutionary nonsense. And how do we get there? Well, through critical awakening. This process of denunciation and, and, un and enunciation, I'll just kind of clarify very quickly uh, as he has it. He says that the critical, for, for Erie, the critical theorist or the woke person, you'll see this as fits immediately, is doing something that nobody else can do, which is that they are constantly denouncing the world as it exists, but in a manner that announces a new, more perfect, reimagined world at the same time. So they're constantly denouncing what exists and announcing the arrival of something better, they're, even if they can't describe it. So they're constantly announcing social progress as they denounce. So that's what, a, for, for, for Freire, is the process of critical thought. And he has this whole argument that we'll get into later in a different episode where he talks about how it's not possible for conservatives or reactionaries. It's just simply not possible for them to denounce and announce because as conservatives, they can't denounce the existing society. They have to uh, preserve it or con conserve it. And they therefore cannot be announcing a new society because then that wouldn't be a, that wouldn't be inconsistent, a consistent uh, view with, with conserving the existing society. So what you're seeing here in denunciation and enunciation is that the critical theorist is constantly seeking change, constantly seeking change. Nothing is ever going to be able to be uh, stable. Nothing is ever allowed to be that way. So we can now go into queer theory and see it's an identity without an essence. You're never allowed to have a stable LGBTQ identity. According to queer theory, that's not the point of queer theory, tells us Hannah Dyer in the paper I read in Groomer Schools too, about queer futurity. No, the queer individual by their very existence is constantly denouncing the existing sexual or gender or whatever order and is announcing and, and is announcing a new one that it's totally fluid constantly doing this perpetual revolution never any stability in conclusion freire provides in this book and this is the last paragraph and the end of this podcast in conclusion freire provides in this book a view of pedagogy and praxis that is partisan to its core for in its origins and intentions, it is for choosing life, which is in scare quotes and means Marxism, because they believe that there is no real life outside of Marxism or communism, because it's oppression and oppression. What do you hear from like patriarchy hurts men too, right? And sexism injures men too. Racism injures white people too. As long as there's oppression in the world, we're not all free. We're not all equal and free. And so uh, choosing life means communism. It's partisan to its core, for in its origins and intentions, it is for choosing life. Um, choosing life instead of the constant stagnating death of living in the current oppressive world. Now, think of how profoundly religious that statement is. Why? Because life is what you get to live when the kingdom of God is built. It's, it, it, if this were a statement about Christianity, because it came from liberation theology, and it said, in conclusion, Freire provides in this book a view of pedagogy and praxis that is religious to its core, changed one word, for in its origins and intentions, or no, let's leave out partisan, let's not say religious, let's say Christian. In conclusion, Freire provides in this book a view of pedagogy and praxis that is Christian to its core, for in its origins and intentions, it is for choosing eternal life. Nobody would be confused about what's going on. Life exists within the kingdom of God made on earth by Marxists, according to the Marxian faith, when everybody is social man living in the social reality, social society, in other words, communism, and doesn't know how to live outside of one. And so it's partisan now to that in its core for its or origins and intentions is for choosing life. Um, it's a very religious statement. Remember, Freire is the woke prophet. Moreover, Freire demonstrates once again that he is not only a man of the present, but also a man of the future. He's a prophet. He's being set up as a prophet. Remember, he has a prophetic vision for his whole thing. That's where we started today. His speech, actions, warmth, and vision. Remember, I told you that Drew holds this guy up like he's like, like a guru. It's so weird the way they talk about it. His speech, actions, warmth, and vision 
represent a way of acknowledging and criticizing a world that lives perilously close to destruction. No, it doesn't. They just say that all the time. If we're not, because the Marxist view is if we're not having Marxism like right away, we're going to have destruction because capitalism is going to kill everybody and kill everything. It's not even true. They just, this is their fundamental uh, hatred of, of what is, is coming out. So he, but Paulo Freire's speech, actions, warmth, and vision represent a way of acknowledging and criticizing a world that lives per perilously close to destruction. In one sense, Freire's world, remember this was written when Ronald Reagan was president and all the progressives were freaking the fuck out. That's why it's perilously close to destruction, because Ronald Reagan was president. Little did they know in 1985 when this book was written that the Soviet Union was going to collapse in four years. Little did they know. Little did they know perilously close to destruction. In one sense, Freire's work and presence remind us not simply of what we are, but also of the possibilities of what we might become. Super Hegelian sentence. We're going to come back to that, but I'm going to read the last sentence of the book of the intro first. His newest book could not have come at a more important time. Sense of urgency is white supremacy culture, Henry, remember? And uh, by the way, that's, that, that's a trick, not a lie, a trick. Why? Because we are now awakening to a sense of urgency that our culture is being taken over by Marxists, and they're going to say that that's white supremacy culture and always has been. They set the trap. Um, but at any rate, in one sense, let's do this last sentence, then we'll sum up and get out of here. Freire's work and presence remind us not simply of what we are, Marxian faith, we're creators, man in himself, creator but also the possibilities of what we might become. Now, you cannot read anything rooted in Marxism and hit the word become and not raise an eyebrow. You have to learn this. There, the dialectical faith is a faith of becoming. It is that we are, in fact, because it's ultimately hermetic in its orientation, it is that the view within all Marxian faith is that... Uh, Whatever the creator is, man in himself as creator, has this world as an abject other. So for Hegel, it was the divine idea, the absolute idea, creates the mundane world as its absolute other. God creates the world as its other by which it might come to know itself. Within the Marxian faith, it is man in himself creates the world in his subjective experience of it in his mind by his work. He creates the world so that he might know himself. And at the moment when he realizes that the object that he works upon, which includes himself and his entire species for Marx, the ob moment when he realizes that the, the as subject, the moment that he realizes that the object that he works upon is continuous with him, that he isn't, that, that the world in fact is that which exists in his subjective experience of the world, that they are co-continuous, and that it exists to teach him that fact, that he is creator, that the world, the abject other created by the, the I I'd say the absolute idea for Hegel, creating the world, so that he might know himself through the life processes and activities of, say, people working out the dialectic. When that happens, that's when man, for Marx, has become social man. So what possibilities of what we might become means through the process of constantly doing this, the work-based dialectic of practice, we can end up becoming social man who lives in a perfectly social society that has no oppression, no domination, etc. So this is a re-articulation of the Marxist theology, and it's why I had to do a huge diversion in the Marxist theology to even be able to talk about what Freire is bringing to the table. And Freire becomes its prophet that changes it enough so that it becomes wokeness. Giroux is his first big evangelist. And that's the context in which we need to approach Freire going forward. And that's what made it so difficult uh, up to this point to be able to kind of decode and explain this. And I'm sorry this ran so long. I actually thought this was going to be a shorter episode. But it's what you need to understand is, out of this episode, the take home is this is very blatantly a religion, meaning critical education theory or critical pedagogy is very blatantly a religion. It is a uh, seemingly secular, secularized repackaging of Marxist theology into education theory, explicitly a repackaging according to this book, which is a 
core text. It is the text that brought Freire's work to the center of American education theory in the 1980s. It is explicitly a repackaging of liberation theology into education theory. It is explicitly forwarding a religion, and when our government, Department of Education, or whatever at the state, local, or federal level supports it, it is an explicit endorsement of state religion in our public schools, one that is antithetical to Christianity. It is a heresy, and it's not difficult to prove. It's been done a bunch of times. First of all, the whole becoming thing I just said is a complete rejection of, of, of Christianity. God did not say in the Bible that I brought you into the world so that you can become a creator uh, and realize yourself to be that. And uh, God did not create the world according to the Bible so that he might know himself. God is the I am. God is the Alpha and the Omega. God is uh, God is the is is eternal and uh, omniscient and omnipotent, etc. He's got all these divine attributes. He is not changing or learning or becoming a damn thing. God is. And so when you have a religion based on the idea that God in man as creator, that's Marx, uh, or there is no God but, but man. Man created God as an image of himself rather than God creating man in his image. According to Marxism, it's a complete inversion. Uh and that that is becoming, through the process of Marxist conscientization, becoming con critically conscious, and that that's supposed to happen in all acts at all times, that is an antithetical to Christianity religion. And Christianity, reactionary Christianity, according to Freire, is to be kicked out of all schools. Why in the world is the so-called radical underbelly of revolutionary Christianity repackaged as critical education theory supposed to be not only allowed in, but endorsed by the state and apparently the only way we can really do anything, despite the fact that we can already see the data are already in. It's already been a catastrophe and the destruction of our schools, something like a third, a third of high school graduates right now are proficient in like virtually anything, if I, whatever that statistic is. It's, it's abysmal what's going on in our schools. And the reason is absolutely clear, because this religion has taken over our schooling and our education theory and our education practice, quite literally at the administrative and education er, and, and teaching levels, for at least 40 years, if not a little bit longer. And this religion of Freire is getting infused into it, at least by 1990s, 30 years ago, is another key component of how that's occurred and how that's happened. Various tools have been used to shuttle this crap into our kids, whether it's a self-esteem movement within schools, which ruined the millennials, didn't work, terrible idea, or whether it's this new social-emotional learning stuff that whatever the new generation, Generation Alpha or whatever they're calling it, after Gen Z, the social emotional learning stuff is going to be an unfathomable catastrophe. Like the buildings on fire, get your kids out of it. Uh, it is a disaster. And then the next project is probably going to be straight liberatory education, which is just, it's like the, the, the virus is shedding off its various like cobbled on pieces that made it a lie. And now we're back, just getting back down to the liberatory education that the Marxists wanted to talk about in the first place back in the sixties and seventies. Uh, and so this is what, what, what we've got in Freire. We've got this blatant religion, blatant religion of Marxism being shuttled into the schools under this guy's name in, in following in his, in his footsteps and his work. He's the prophet of all this crap, critical education theory and wokeness. It's a complete catastrophe. And if you are worried about, depending on whatever, there's two huge perspectives. If you don't want any religion in the schools whatsoever, you obviously want this out then. And if you think that, um, you know, if religion should be in schools, I'm betting Betting and betting and betting, you're probably Christian and you don't want something that's literally uh, antithetical heresy made out of Marxism posing as radical revolutionary Christianity uh, guiding the education of your children. So now we can understand who Freire is. He's the prophet of wokeness. He's the godfather of critical pedagogy, which is the, the circumstances in which wokeness really took its mature form. It's where the, I started out talking about, it's the emulsifier that mixed postmodernism 
which we've referred to throughout this podcast and critical theory, which we've also referred to throughout this podcast and this kind of horrific mayonnaise that's ruining the world. And uh, Freire becomes this central character. So in the future episodes of the critical education theory podcast, I've got to jump forward and talk about culturally responsive teaching. So I'm going to do that soon, but then we're going to tear through this book, the politics of education by Paulo Freire. And then we're going to get to Paulo Freire's pedagogy, the oppressed, which is kind of like the super holy text that almost nobody really reads uh, behind the curtain of all uh, education colleges and thus all education in North America, or at least in the United States right now. And you're learning some of the history. You're also learning what this actually is. And I look forward to talking to you more about this as we continue to peel the layers of this nasty onion and see what's inside.